Happy Easter and Resurrection Sunday. My name is Brighton. We're so glad to celebrate Christ's resurrection with you today at King Street Church. Pastor Rob Gunkelman and Pastor Adam Keefe will be sharing the message, Are You Ready for a Savior? For those worshiping in person, we offer two photo backdrops where you can take a family picture. There are also activity bags for children available in the lobbies. If you'd like to learn more about our church family, we invite you to meet with a lobby host at the Welcome Center in the main lobbies or chat online with your service host. All of today's announcements and many more are available in your worship folder and online at kingstreetchurch.com slash today. This morning, we are celebrating baptisms and you will see their testimonies written out in the worship folder. We encourage you to take a moment to read these words describing God's work in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ. On the back of the worship folder, you'll see several ways to connect with groups here at King Street Church, which offer community and discipleship. We have ministries for children and students on Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. The Porch Young Adult Ministry meets on the first and third Thursdays of the month. Reset is a worship time and support system that meets every Monday night and includes breakout groups for men and women seeking to tear down walls that keep us from an abundant life in Christ. On Sunday, May 19th, we are hosting an all-church outdoor service. We will come together as one large united body of Christ to celebrate God's work in our lives and to enjoy both worship and community. We are planning to have several food trucks for lunch, so invite your friends and let's enjoy an amazing Sunday together. Also in May, we will open registration for Vacation Bible School and summer events for our students. It's an exciting season in the life of our church, and we invite you to be a part of it. Visit kingstreetchurch.com to learn more about who we are and the many ways we seek to engage and bless our community with the gospel. We are so glad to have you worshiping with us. We believe that Jesus is risen and that he is alive and working today. It is our prayer that you would experience great joy and the hope and abundant life that we have in him. Why Jesus? Why all the talk of crucifixions and the resurrection of the dead? The idea that our present reality can be radically transformed by one historical day from antiquity? Why does this one event persist to shake nations, stands against kingdoms, relentlessly remaining there in every test in time? Why does the life of one rabbi bring hope to the billions and peace beyond understanding, peace even in facing death? His axioms transcend culture, moving between and among every generation, offering new grace with each day to the poor and to the rich, to the young and to the old, each who calls his name. 
This is not just a page between the chapters of history, neither myth, metaphor, nor a line of spectacular exaggeration. His influence on every human life story is unfit to be placed into any existing category. No, Jesus isn't written into our story. Rather, our story is written into his. Every authority, even the grave, obeys his sovereign will. This is why we exalt the mighty name of Jesus over and over and over again. His victory has given us life. His mercies stand at the center of our faith. He alone holds the pen of history. He is the one true God, and at that, a God who died for us. Why rejoice? Why is this our anthem? The answer for why Jesus comes down to this. Jesus is at the center. His victory over the grave is written into every line between old and new, between death and life. There stands one historical reality, the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is alive. Welcome to Easter at King Street Church. It's great to be here. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is risen indeed. Amen. Let's say it again. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. One more time, it's 8 o'clock. He is risen. He is risen indeed. indeed. Oh, it's great to worship the Lord together on this Easter Sunday and to celebrate the resurrection in which everything changed. Everything changed as Jesus Christ is alive, living in us. His spirit is in us and helps us to worship this morning. It's great to be here together. If you're new to King Street, we would love to meet you. So please come up and uh, introduce yourself to myself or Pastor Rob will be in the service. Uh, I see Pastor Adams here. Would love to meet you and to just help you get connected. And if you're shy, you can go to the website and email us and uh, connect with us, all right? I, I invite you to stand right now and uh, take a moment to greet the people around you and uh, make them feel welcome. Loved it. Good job, Bill. Rise, O oh church, and lift your voices. Christ has conquered death and hell. Sing as all the Choices, resurrection and the swell. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the risen King. See the tomb where death has laid him empty. Now its mouth declares death and I could not contain him for the throne of life he shares. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the risen King. Hear the earth protest and tremble, see the stone removed with Minions may assemble, but cannot withstand his heart. He has conquered, he has conquered, Christ the Lord, the risen King. Death.
my Lord. Up from the grave he arose, with the mighty triumph for his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. getting ready to celebrate a baptism this morning. And uh, from our understanding here at King Street Church, there's nothing salvific about this baptism. There's nothing, it doesn't make Braxton any holier. This is actually just a representation of what God has already done in his life. And we're celebrating his decision to follow Christ. And so enjoy his testimony, and then we're going to baptize Braxton. Hello, my name is Braxton Binshoff. And I'm in second grade, and I'm eight years old, and I go to Shalom Christian Academy. I asked Jesus into my heart at whenever I was seven at, at, at Bible school. I want to be baptized today because I want to show the whole world that I'm a Christian and I believe in God. Amen. I don't know if you all can see him. He just looks like a floating head to you, but, <laughs> but he's in here. Braxton, do you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? I do. Do you intend to live for him who died for you? I do. Then upon that profession of faith, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in a new life. <laughs> Please join me in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this profession of faith by Braxton and that he wants to say to the whole world that he believes in you, Jesus, and he wants to follow you. And I just pray, oh God, in the name of Jesus Christ, for your blessing on Braxton. And God, as all of us witness his baptism, many of us remember the decision we made to follow you, Jesus. Help us as we witness this just to reaffirm on this special day, this Resurrection Sunday, to reaffirm our commitment to you, Jesus. And with more determination and passion and strength, We want to follow you. Help us, O Spirit of God. For those who are here in the sanctuary or online, maybe we have not made a decision yet to follow you, Jesus. But we're here observing what is happening here, the singing, the passion, the excitement about you, Jesus, and your resurrection and how you have Forgiven us of our sins, and you have redeemed us, and you have given us hope as we have repented of our sins, and you have changed us. Oh, God, may all in this space and those online uh, be uh, impacted, (laughs) Uh, be encouraged to follow you, Jesus Christ. And God, for each one here and online, I just pray God, you know what's going on in our lives, and I pray that you would help each one, Lord Jesus, by your power, by your hope, by your spirit, who is alive and in all those who have a relationship with you, Jesus. God, I pray for our world today. Oh, our world needs peace that only you can give, Jesus. Only a God who is alive can change the course of our world, can change the course of our nation and the people, can bring love, can bring peace. And so we pray for that again on this special day that changes eternity. Oh God, change the things in the world and the nation. Bring love, bring peace, bring hope. Oh Lord Jesus Christ. I pray as we continue to worship and as we give back to you and as we celebrate you, God, receive our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings for your honor, for your glory, to bless the people around us, to bless the world. Receive what little we have, and maybe we give out of not very much means, or maybe we have a lot God, you look at it the same. Receive what we have and use our tithes, gifts, and offerings for your kingdom, for your glory. We love you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your giving. Uh, We uh, just appreciate it. There's different ways in which you can give. Let's continue to worship the Lord together.
It's great to have our brass group joining us on Easter Sunday. Thank you, guys. Uh, great job. We appreciate your ministry of music. Uh, thank you. And it's great to have Bob Jones with me. And we uh, want to direct your attention to the Gospel of John account of the resurrection. Uh, Bob and I are going to share it and read it together. And uh, then you just follow along with us. Uh, this is from John 20. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Will you please stand? And let's sing with all that we have in us. He lives. Jesus lives. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever man say I see his hand of mercy I hear his voice of cheer and just the time I need him he's always near he lives he lives, he lives, he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives Salvation to impart You ask me how I know He lives He lives within my heart In all the world around me I see His loving care And though my heart grows weary I never will despair I know that He is leading all the stormy past, the day of his appearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives, he lives salvation to impart. You ask me how.
Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, he lives, he lives salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Because he Would you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for sending your son, Jesus. We thank you for the cross. We thank you that you are alive, that the tomb is empty. Jesus Christ lives. We love you, Lord. I pray for Pastor Rob now as he brings the message and as we celebrate our risen Savior. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. 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 He is alive. He is alive. He is alive. This is a, a great day. Uh, for those of you joining online, a big welcome to you. Uh, for those of you that might be first time guests or visitors, we hope here at King Street Church that not only do you feel welcome, but that it's a place where you feel like you can, it's warm and inviting and where you can find community. Because we believe that through community, Sunday schools, L3 groups, different discipleship pathways, that God is gonna reveal how he has uniquely gifted you so that you can go out and bless and engage your community, where you work, where you sleep, where you play with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you are maybe just someone who comes on Easter and Christmas only, uh, welcome. You and I have more in common than you might think. Uh, I spent the majority of my teenage years and my early 20s really just questioning my faith, and uh, I didn't really go to church much, so who knows, in five years you might be up here teaching. But um, I grew up in, a, in, a, in an area in North Dakota and we went to a church, and it pretty much what I got out of church was, was don't drink, don't smoke, and don't, and, and don't do, and, uh, and, don't dare, and don't date girls who do. So uh, seemingly that's easy enough, but in North Dakota, even the homecoming queen dips, and she's like, Bing. so it's, it got more difficult. But uh, we just want you guys to feel welcome. Um, one of the things that we believe here this year, we are talking about the abundant life and how God has come to give us the abundant life. And I used to think that the abundant life was a life of, of luxury, more money, a, a fat 401k, a lot of cars, a lot of travel, things like that. But I understood like that's not what it's about. See, in John 10.10, 10, God says that the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. The devil's only job 
is to steal your joy, is to kill your passion, to kill relationships, and to destroy your life. He does not want you to, to have an exciting life. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus came so that we could experience this abundant life. And so the abundant life isn't, like I was saying, materialistic. The abundant life is a life of purpose, it's a life of hope, and it's a life of peace. I think the most amazing thing is that when people get a cancer diagnosis, to watch them, if they know Jesus is their Lord and Savior, they, they get this cancer diagnosis, and yet there's this hope and there's this strength that they know that no matter what happens, it's part of God's plan. Not that he wanted you to get sick, but that he's going to use your disease for his glory. Right? And so the thing is, God wants us to experience this life so that we can go out and we can bless and we can engage and we can, we can share his love with everybody. But Satan wants to do something. Satan will use our past mistakes to keep us from experiencing the life that Christ intended for us to live. He's going to say, oh, you think you want to go out and share the gospel. Well, guess what? You had a failed marriage. You can't do that. Oh, you had an abortion. You can't do that. Oh, you, I know what you looked like last night on the internet. You can't. How can God possibly use you? And before you know it, you're trapped in this, this shame cycle, and it's over and over again. You're just feeling terrible about yourself. That's never what God intended, right? The problem is, if you look to Scripture, if you know a little bit about Scripture, these feelings can isolate you, right? And they can cause you to put on a face when you come to church. Feelings of, of regret, feelings of remorse, feelings of, of failure, they cause you to, to put on a face and an act. See, church was never meant to be a, a showcase for the holiest of holy people, right? It's always meant to be a hospital, a place where people can come and they can struggle and they can say, man, I am really struggling in this area of my life. But we don't do that. Unfortunately, church is a place where you have to, you have to put on the face and no matter what's happening, right? You're yelling at your kids in the morning to get them to church on time. It's Easter Sunday, get your dress on, stop pulling it over your head, all this stuff. You're just trying to get to church on time. You're yelling at the kids the entire way, this is Easter, be happy, right? And they're crying, and then you get out in the parking lot, and you see some people, and they're like, how are you doing this morning? You're like, oh, blessed and highly favored. Whoo, amen, <laughs> right? It's tough. I've been there. But that's not what church is supposed to be. Church is supposed to be a place where you can come and you can just be yourself, where you can be vulnerable, right? The problem is that it's not. And so then, like, I, when I used to struggle with this, I would look at Scripture, like Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. This is God speaking, right? Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Man, sometimes I don't feel very hopeful. I look at myself, I'm like, God, how can you possibly do that? And then you read in Ephesians 2, 10, where it says that, for we are his workmanship, some versions say we are his masterpiece. We're the greatest thing that he's ever created. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Well, that's amazing. Like, I'm God's, I'm God's miracle. I'm God's greatest workmanship. I'm his, his greatest creation. Man, there are times where I don't feel like that. And then I'm questioning God. God, if I'm your greatest creation, man, you have messed up. You missed the mark because I'm terrible, Right? And so you start to beat yourself up. And then the question becomes, how are we supposed to experience a life filled with hope? How are we supposed to experience a life filled with peace when we continually fall short of God's standard? How do we do that, right? Well, God knows the thoughts that you're going to have, and he, he says it to us in Romans 3.23. He says, for all I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And he's saying that it's okay. Everyone fails. There's no one out there who doesn't sin. Right? And what I used to do is I used to, I, I would look at Scripture at, for, for just kind of like encouragement how to live my life. And I would see people like Enoch. Enoch walked so closely with God that he never experienced death. I see people like Elijah, where Elijah did everything that God wanted him to do, that when it was Elijah's time to go, God sent him an Uber. A chariot out of heaven came and took him back. Right? And I'm like, well, that's never going to be me. The good news is this. For every Enoch and Elijah that you read about in the Bible, there are numerous examples of God using messed up individuals throughout all of Scripture. You're like, man, I just, 
if I had the leadership potential and capabilities of Moses, man, then I could, I could run my company and do some amazing things. Well, fantastic. Moses murdered a dude, got caught, tried to cover it up. When he, found, when he found out that other people knew, he ran away for 40 years. And then when God said, hey, your people are struggling in Egypt, go and, go and release them, lead them out. He's like, oh, you don't understand, God. And he starts to make excuses. I st stutter, I can't speak, I, I'm just not good at this. You need to use my brother. Go, go use Aaron, right? That doesn't sound like a leader. That doesn't sound like a dynamic individual, right? Well, what about David? He's a man after God's own heart. Oh, amazing. All right, look at David. David struggled with lust. He's looking out one night and he sees Bathsheba. He sleeps with her, gets her pregnant, tries to cover his tracks by inviting Uriah back. But then what happens? Uriah is a man of character and he's like, if my soldiers can't be with their wives, I'm not gonna be with my wife. And so he doesn't even go home. So David's in a pickle and he's like, you know what? I'm gonna send Uriah to the front line so he'll be killed and then I'll marry Bathsheba and no one will be the wiser. Sounds like an amazing man, right? He was a liar, he's a cheat, he's a murderer. Maybe I don't wanna be like David. And then he's, well, Father Abraham, right? Father Abraham, he had many sons. Had many sons, had Father Abraham, right hand, left foot. You all know the song. You're like, he's the father of our faith. Of course we want to be like him. The faith, God asked him to sacrifice his only son. He's right about to do it, and then God provides a ram in the thicket. But the thing is, before that, he didn't trust in God's providence for him. God said, I'm going to give you a son. And instead of waiting on God's timing, he slept with his wife's uh, maidservant, and the Middle East has been fighting ever since, right? That's, it's just, that's what happens. And so God doesn't use perfect people. God's plan, God's desire for us is to follow, isn't to follow just a bunch of rules in order to earn his grace. From the beginning of time, he has desired a relationship with his creation. See, our, our, our faith isn't just one of rules. That's not what it is. Our faith is one of a relationship with our creator. I like how the Westminster Shorter Catechism puts it. It says, a man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Like our, our, uh, the, why we are created is not just so that we live a perfect life and we please God enough to get into heaven. That's not it. Easter is all about God saying, I love you so much that I'm restoring this relationship with you so that you can enjoy me forever, not just in this life, but forever. The thing is, we, sometimes we fail that. And I hear people all the time when I invite them to church, oh, I don't wanna go to church, it's full of hypocrites and judgment. Well, congratulations, the whole American society is full of hypocrites and judgment, right? The problem is, people think that we should be better. We should be better, we should be more vulnerable. People should look at church and be like, man, that is a bunch of messed up people. However, there's something different with God, and so they're able to, able to live together and to strive together and to support each other. That's the attraction, right? My students understand this. Students understand this very well, and they can read through the showcase that people put on. And so they'll always ask, if God is good, why does he allow bad things to happen to good people? I also get why does it allow good things to happen to bad people, right? Why doesn't he just fix his creation? I don't know, I don't know. All I know is if Jesus Christ himself, who's perfect, suffered something bad, then more than likely, we're gonna suffer some difficulties in our life as well, right? I don't know why he doesn't just etch a sketch it, right? And erase his creation, then restart. I don't know, I would, I would have done that, but that's not it. See, God's plan was never that we would experience the kind of hurts or loss or frustrations that we do every single day. His, his original plan was one of relationship with Adam and Eve in the garden. He created it so that we were gonna have this amazing relationship face to face with God, and we're gonna be able to enjoy him forever. But he knew that sin was gonna enter the world in the form of Satan taking the form of a snake and sin, when sin entered the world, his perfect creation fell. And the further we get away from the original sin, the worse our world becomes. Here's the cool part. Our world is still feel, filled with beauty. 
You can still look out into creation and be in awe of what God has done. So I'm super excited for what it's going to look like when we get to heaven. But from the beginning, God's plan was to redeem a fallen world for himself. That's why he, that's why he sent Jesus to die for us. See, a lot of times we think that we have to have it all together. And that in order to, in order to go to church, we have to have it all together. Oh, I can't, I can't go to church because I've had a few bad weeks. Let me put together a couple of good weeks where I'm doing what I need to do, and that way I can step in through the building. That's not it, right? When I was struggling with my pastoral call, uh, I just didn't think that I was worthy of it, and God sent me this verse. He said, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. God wants to use our weaknesses. God wants to use our difficulties. See, God uses imperfect people to bring about his perfect will. And there's no greater example than this than the story of Easter. (laughs) It's amazing. See, what Jesus did is Jesus, he's fully man, fully God. And he came down and he lived a very, very real life. And he, he could have been born into power. He could have been born into royalty. That's what the, the Jewish people were looking for. They were looking for a conquering king. But Jesus came as a suffering servant. Jesus came as a son of a carpenter. And he lived for 30 years preparing for his ministry. And then all of a sudden he started his ministry. And in doing so, he fed the hungry, he healed the sick, he let the lame walk, he gave sight to the blind, he gave hearing and speech to people who couldn't. It was amazing. All he was doing was serving people. And yet, because Jesus challenged the status quo and the paradigm of worship of the religious elite of his day, they hated him for it. They hated him for it. See, the Pharisees, their only job was to keep an eye out for the Messiah. He was going to do works. He was going to do wonders. But they were thinking he was also going to lead, he was going to lead Jerusalem to freedom. Right? And when they didn't, they began to, to fear the reputation that he was building. And they were beginning to fear that he was going to lead their people in the wrong way. But Jesus was changing the paradigm. See, it's, Jesus was saying it's not all about following your 638 rules and commandments in the Old Testament. Jesus said, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul, and then you love others in the same way, then you have completed the entire law. Jesus came with a new covenant, not one of works, not one of based on, on, on rules and regulations, but one based on relationship and repentance. And it's amazing. But because he was doing this on the night where he's, they're celebrating the Last Supper, Satan got in. And he started to change things. All of a sudden, Judas gets up, and he goes and he betrays Jesus to the authorities, to the high priest, to the chief priests. And so Jesus, after the meal, knows what's coming, and he's in the garden of Gethsemane, as was his custom, and he was praying. And then as he's finishing up, Judas comes over, and he says, teacher, and he gives him a kiss on the cheek. And Mark records it this way. He says, And they led Jesus away to the high priest, and with him were assembled all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. What they were doing, they were actually having an illegal trial. You weren't allowed to have a trial at night, but they came and they got Jesus at night because they were worried about the masses. And then once they had condemned him, they were going to take him to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was the governor of the area. That's how Rome kind of ruled over their entire world. So Rome, at this time, ruled over 2 million square miles. That's, that's a massive, massive, like, empire. And so what, how they would rule, it wasn't just kind of like grace and maybe a, a fine here and there. That's not it. They ruled with an iron fist. And so if Jesus was condemned, what the, the, the Jewish people would bring their criminals, and they would bring them to Pontius Pilate, and then he would, he would punish them. And the way that they would punish them, they would flog them. Now, we hear flogging, and we're like, oh, well, that stinks. They must have got, like, the paddle or something like that. No, they got the cat of nine tails. This was a whip with nine different strands on it, and it had bone and glass and pottery and all sorts of things so that when they whipped them, it would latch into their meat, and then they'd pull hunks off. There's recorded histories of, of ribs being pulled off completely. And they would whip you 40 times. 
And if you survived that, then they would crucify you, right? They'd, they'd nail you to a cross. And we have this idea in our mind that the cross is like 20 feet high and you're nailed up for everybody to see. It. It's not that. The, the, the Romans, it was more of that size. The Romans would put you on like a six foot cross so that you're eye level with everybody, unless you're Pastor Steve, he's still looking up. But, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but they nail you to that cross, right? They nail you to that cross and then people come by and they mock you, they spit on you, they slap you, they do whatever they want, and it's a way for Rome, and they put you in the middle of everything so that people walking to work, people walking to their home, they see all these people being crucified, and they're like, I don't ever want to misstep. I don't want to be an enemy of Rome, right? That's how Rome ruled. So Mark continues, and he says, the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. I read this, I'm like, God, why didn't you just say something? Defend yourself. But Jesus understood, right? Jesus understood what was happening. This is part of his plan. This is the plan of redemption. See, ultimately, Jesus' execution was the execution of God's plan to save his creation. And so I imagine that Jesus is just sitting there with this, this quiet confidence, knowing that his plan from, from the beginning is coming to fruition. And so Jesus was, was beaten beyond recognition. He was forced to carry his cross until he could no longer physically do it. And he was humiliated, and he was stripped naked, and then he was nailed to the cross for all to spit on and for all to mock. That's our Savior. That's how he came back. See, they would have nailed him and put him here. This is, the, uh, this is Golgotha or, or Calvary. And it's the, there's like a skull there. It's a bus stop today. And I think that's really fitting because they crucified him just outside of the city gates. And it would have been a thoroughfare where everyone's at and they would all walk by him. And so Jesus is, is nailed up there and and the problem with crucifixion, well, there's a lot, but one of the problems with crucifixion is that you can't breathe. And so Jesus would have had to fight. He would have had to push up on his nailed feet. He would have had to push up on his hands just to get a breath. And then he'd sink back down. And then he'd have to push up again and get a breath and then sink back down. This was difficult. It was hard work. And so they offered him some wine, some sour wine. And as he took it, he sort of refused it. And so, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This word, the Greek word for it is finished is tetelestai. If you guys look like a tattoo crowd, so that might be a good idea for a tattoo. <laughs> but when Jesus died, he said, it is finished. His plan was finished. His life was finished. And he died and the sun darkened and then there was this massive earthquake. And what happened in the temple, they used to separate the Ark of the Covenant, but it was called the Holiest of Holies, and there was this massive veil, and it was a symbol that only the high priest could interact with God. And when it tore from the ceiling to the floor, what God was saying is, no longer do you have to access me through a high priest. You have a direct connection with me. We can now, because of Jesus' sacrifice, we can now re-engage in the relationship that I've always craved, always desired. And so as I'm reading this story a couple years ago, this figure starts sticking out to me. See, we're watching this narrative of God and, and his, it's a beautiful but sad story of how he is redeeming his creation. But then we see this person, this man whose name is Barabbas. And you see him and it, he just doesn't belong there. This is, this is all about Easter, this is all about Jesus. Why is Barabbas in this story? Mark records, he says, there is one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. So they, they were rebelled against Rome. They led an insurrection. They murdered people. They stole. They, they were just bad people all around. And so he's sitting there, and he's, he's with his fellow rebels, right? And then all of a sudden, Pilate's wife says, 
please don't crucify Jesus. I've had him have bad dreams all night, all day. Just, you're not supposed to do this. And Pilate's like trying to figure out how he can do this. So he's like, okay, I'm going to bring up Barabbas, and I'm going to bring up Jesus. Of course, because what happened, there's a, a custom. Rome would have these customs of the, the lands that they took over so that they wouldn't rebel all the time. And one of the customs was during Passover, they would release one of the criminals as kind of like, a, like, a, like an honoring of Passover. So they would release a criminal. And so Pontius Pilate's like, well, of course they'll choose Jesus, right? He's done nothing wrong. They're going to they're gonna crucify Barabbas. And so Pilate is seemingly holding the destiny of these two men in his hands, right? You've got Barabbas, who's a murderer, who's a rebel. He's an insurrectionist. And then you've got Jesus. What has Jesus ever done? All Jesus ever did was serve people, was care for people, love people. Of course they're going to kill Barabbas. So Barabbas, the Pilate answered them saying, do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. He understood. He's not dumb. He knows what's happening. He understands that Jesus has this reputation and that the, the religious elite are not happy about it. So there should be no question. There should be no comparison. Barabbas, he's a leader of an insurrection. He's a murderer. He's, he, he spits on the face of Rome. And then you have Jesus. Who would you choose? Right? We, would all, we would all choose Jesus. See, Barabbas deserved the chains. And he deserved death. Jesus, man, all he did, he just deserves to be honored and revered. But that's not what happened. Satan starts working, and he gets the chief priest to stir up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Think if you're Barabbas. You are, you're in 50 pounds of chains around your neck, around your waist, around your ankles. You're in shackles, and it's weighing you down, and you have no hope because you know Jesus by reputation. You know what he did, and you're like, man, I'm done. There's no hope. And then all of a sudden, you start hearing people say, give us Barabbas. Right? Give us Barabbas. And you're like, oh, maybe I have a little bit of hope. Right? And they're like, what do you want me to do with Jesus? And they're like, crucify him. In one moment, Barabbas is set free from the weight of his chains, from the penalty of his crimes, and he has regained the promise of a future. Jesus condemned to a grisly death. That's where he's headed. And here's the thing, if I'm Barabbas and all of a sudden my chains are loosed and I get my life back, the promise of a future, I'm sprinting to Jesus and I'm going to bow down to his feet and I'm going to kiss his feet and say, thank you, I owe you everything. But there seems to be no gratitude or acceptance of what Jesus has done for him. We don't read where Barabbas goes over to Jesus and says, thank you, I owe you everything. We don't read of Barabbas even turning or acknowledging Jesus. No, what we see is Barabbas kind of going up to his people and dapping them up and being like, yeah, this is great. Look how great people love me. I knew when I started this rebellion that people would respect me. Look how great I am. <laughs> Jesus, I imagine that he's just sitting over here, and I don't think he's shocked. I think he's got a smirk on his face, right? <laughs> Judah Smith says something, and it's really poignant. He says, for Jesus knew that the father would have to treat Jesus like Barabbas so that he could treat Barabbas like Jesus. Man, Jesus' plan is coming to fruition. Barabbas thought it was the people who had set him free, but he couldn't have been further from the truth. It was Jesus. Jesus set Barabbas free. So when I'm starting to look at this story, I realize who Barabbas really is, right? Barabbas is you. Barabbas is me. I'm Barabbas. How many times have I taken Jesus for granted where he sets me free, where he forgives me? This week, Holy Week, how many times has God said, it's okay? And man, I just look at God, I'm like, no, God, I deserve consequence. I deserve punishment. And God says, no, Rob, I love you. But God, you don't understand. I was addicted for so long, you can't possibly use me. And he says, no, Rob, I love you. No, God, you don't understand. I'm not perfect. I'm not the greatest husband. I'm not the greatest father. I have all these things in my life that point to where you should just punish me like I'm Barabbas. And he's saying, no, I, I love you. Right? 
The story of Easter isn't only about God's redeeming of his creation. It's about his love for Barabbas, for you and for me. That is what Easter is all about. It's love. How could Jesus sit on the cross? It's love. He says it in Romans, right? God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's love. That's who Jesus is. That's who God is. God's not cosmic police up there who's ready to rain down judgment. That's not it. God is a God of love. It's like when I first held my, ba- my daughter Ashley. She was the furthest thing I'd ever seen in my life, and I was holding her, and I loved her more than anything. To say that I would die for her is stupid. Of course I would, right? She didn't bring anything to the party, and in that moment, I understood something about God's love for me. If me, a selfish individual, can love something that much, then God, who is perfect, who is without sin, can love even more, exponentially more, than I could. See, Jesus is sitting at the foot of the cross, The Roman soldiers are putting it together. He's getting ready to be nailed. And Jesus, through through swelling and welts and just pain, is looking forward. And the Bible says this in Hebrews chapter 12, says, for the joy set before him, the joy, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This joy that Jesus is looking at, he is outside of space and time, and he's looking forward, and he's seeing Easter Sunday 2024, and he knows that some screwed up individual is going to be talking about his love. He understands that people with pasts, people who are still caught in sin, people who are struggling with addictions are coming to Easter service here. And he's saying, tell them about my love. See, ultimately, when we look at the story of Easter, it's so easy to focus on the cross because that's where our attention goes. God, you took my place. I deserve that. But that's not the story. That's the reason. The story is Christ's victory over death. The story is his resurrection. That's what this is about. In Mark 16, 5 through 6, it says, And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. Now, if that's all we got, there'd be room for kind of like an argument. Can you really prove that Jesus came back from the dead? Can you really prove this? Can you do this? Well, Jesus appeared eight different times to various people after his resurrection. He ate with them. He cried with them. He forgave them. He restored them. He taught them some more. He did life with them for another 40 days. (laughs) There's a reason in the Bible why they use names. Hard to pronounce names. Half the time, pastors just fake it. But... There's a reason. It's because it actually happened. And in the original time when the Bible was written, people would have known these people by reputation. They would have been like, oh, Joe down on 3rd Street? Amazing. He had this experience with Jesus. Crazy. Right? That's why there's names. And so when we read this, it's not, it's not just stories. This is a historical narrative. See, in dying on the cross and defeating death, Jesus paid for your sins and he paid for mine. But when he, when he raised from the dead... Man, he had victory over death. Satan thought that he won, right? For a split second, Satan's like, man, I knew I could do it. Jesus is down here with us. This is great. And then all of a sudden, Jesus defeats the grave. So the question becomes, what shackles are you bound by today? What are you struggling with? What shame, what regret, what remorse does Satan use to continually turn you to inwardly, to say that you don't belong in church. I can't possibly use you, right? There's two types of people in this room. There are those who know the Lord as their, as their Lord and Savior. It's easy to know him as your Savior. No one wants to go to hell, so they're like, yeah, I'll say a prayer. But to make him your Lord, to where when you read the Bible, it's instructions for how you should live your life, that's more difficult, right? And so there's people in this room who maybe they grew up in church, maybe they didn't, but they don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. If that's you today, man, God knew sitting at that cross, looking forward from joy, that today is his invitation. There's someone in here and God is, God is working in them and he's pulling them towards himself. And he's saying, just, just, just 
give in, right? Stop trying so hard, just give in. I desire a relationship. And if that's you, I encourage you to come up. Our, our faith is one of action, it's not one of knowledge, right? Your faith should cause you to do things. And so if that's you, and for the first time you're understanding who Jesus Christ is and the sacrifice that he made for you, I just want to invite you after the service to come up, talk to myself, talk to Pastor Adam, talk to Pastor Steve. Do that. And then there's those of us who have been saved. We've been saved for a long time. And the difficult part of that is that you still sin. You're still not perfect. Hopefully, you're experiencing sanctification, which is Christianese for becoming more like Jesus. Hopefully that's you, but if not, man, the enemy's attacking, and you're stuck, you're shackled up because of your failures. You're shackled up because of past mistakes, and God's invitation to you today is put it down. I've already taken care of it. I, when I died on the cross, I died for your sins, past, present, and future, so give it up. What God wants to do is he wants you to re-engage in that relationship with him, be honest, but then re-engage in community here, and then engage in your community out there. God wants to use you, that's his plan. God uses crooked sticks to hit straight licks all the time. There's nothing you can do that will cause God to turn his back on you, nothing. There's nothing you could have done. If the thief on the cross, right, acknowledged who Jesus was, and he's like, today you're gonna be with me in paradise, then you guys are good. None of you are there. And so return to him, give in. And so in a moment, we're gonna have a time of just response. We respond to the gospel because the gospel's worth responding to. What God did on the cross is worth responding to. And so feel free to, during this last song, to come forward, you can use the stairs. If you want prayer, come forward, we'll be here. But use this time, interact with God. Jesus, at the foot of the cross before he was nailed to it, had joy. Every time someone finds who out, begins a relationship with who Jesus is, there's a party in heaven. Man, let's make, some, let's make some parties today. Let's return to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that you are a God who uses messed up people. God, that throughout all of scripture, there's only two accounts of you taking perfect people to heaven before they pass. And God, I am so thankful for the examples of you using messed up people. God, help us here today to realize the sacrifice that you made, but not just the sacrifice, through the victory that you did on the cross, God, conquering death, you are inviting us to an abundant life, inviting us to experience a life of purpose, a life of peace, and a life of joy. God, we all go through difficult seasons, and I would pray that your blessing would be on each and every single person here that you would draw the lost to you for a relationship, that you would encourage and, and just call people who do know you as their Lord and Savior to be a part of the mission, not just of King Street, but the mission of your church, of movement for all people to deepen their relationship with you. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen, would you please stand and let's respond to God in singing and in action. Thank you. Mr. so bright, crown him the 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious towards you. May he turn to you and give you peace. If you are new to King Street, come say hello. We hope that you can find community here. And uh, out there, y'all, is our mission field. Let's go be the hands and feet of Christ. Have a good Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you so much for joining us for worship today on Resurrection Sunday. If you're joining us today for the first time, we hope you choose to worship with us again next week. As we continue to dig into God's word together, we are looking forward to continuing our abundant life in Christ theme this year in 2024. Here at King Street Church, we have three core values, being spiritually alive in Christ, relationally connected by Christ, and missionally engaged for Christ. And we would like to highlight our first core value. If you have an interest in joining us becoming more spiritually alive in Christ together, a practical application that we encourage you to participate in is our daily Bible reading plan as we go through the New Testament together in 2024. You can receive this digitally to your phone by texting DAILY to 717-401-7777 or you can visit kingstreetchurch.com Bible to sign up for email delivery or download the full year's reading schedule. We are so grateful for our church family. Thanks again for being here with us today. We look forward to worshiping with you next week.
come together strangers neighbors our blood is one children of generations of every nation of kingdom so don't let your heart be troubled your head up I don't fear no evil fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you so take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from
touch his scars and believe he is risen, he is risen, he's alive.